Chapter Nine of A Thousand Degrees Below Zero by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine. Next morning, the world read at its breakfast table that the Mississippi River had frozen over just below St. Louis, and that the water was rising rapidly. The river had frozen solidly up to the surface. The level rose, and the water started to flow over the top of the ice cake, only to be turned into ice as it did so. Hour by hour the level rose, and hour by hour the solid ice barrier rose with the water level. Men had tried to blast a way through for the rushing waters, but without effect. As fast as the water tried to flow through the opening made by a charge of dynamite, it froze again and plugged the hole through which it was attempting to escape. Hastily improvised levees were thrown up, but the water outstripped the efforts of the builders. The lower part of St. Louis was flooded, and a great part of the population made homeless. Then low-lying lands beside the river were gradually submerged. In twenty-four hours there were calls for help all along the upper part of the Mississippi Valley. The rising waters had flooded immense areas of cultivated land, and even larger areas were threatened. In another day, a thousand square miles of crops were under water, and the loss in livestock was assuming formidable proportions. The new cold bomb in New York Harbor had crept up to the battery as Teddy had foreseen. The Norfolk cold bomb had exploded, fortunately without loss of life. Gibraltar had witnessed three almost simultaneous blasts, and was again free of ice, but the whole world knew that it was at the mercy of Varus. Davis, Evelyn, and Teddy were discussing the matter dolefully. Davis had come to the laboratory daily in the hopes of hearing that Teddy had devised some plan for the frustration of Varus's ambitious schemes. Teddy found himself liking Davis immensely, but with a peculiarly illogical annoyance that Evelyn seemed to like him quite as well. When he had phoned her of his safety after the flight with Varus, he could hear a flood of thankfulness in her voice. But when he saw her the next day, she was almost distant. He saw traces of real anxiety on her face, but she had not been really natural until they had worked nearly all day on the silver bracelet, trying to find what had been done to the surface to give it its peculiar property of allowing heat to pass in one direction but not in the other. They were as far as ever from the solution. Davis was quite ignorant of abstract chemistry or physics, and could not join in their discussions. But Teddy fancied that he was much more interested in Evelyn than was necessary. He was annoyed to find that he resented it. He had always looked on Evelyn as a comrade, and he could not understand this feeling that took possession of him. It did not occur to him to speculate upon the fact that he found ideas coming to him much more readily when working by Evelyn's side, or that he rarely attempted anything without asking her opinion. Teddy had never thought much of romance, and he did not suspect how much Evelyn's companionship meant to him. Davis was reiterating for the fortieth time his disappointment at Varus's getting away. "'We almost had him,' he said disgustedly. Our explosive bullets were playing all over his infernal flying machine. We'd have landed one in that little glass cabin of his and smashed him nicely in another minute when he skipped off like that. And I'll swear to it we were doing a hundred and eighty miles an hour. He ran away from us pretty easily, said Teddy dismally. Isn't there a faster machine than yours we could get hold of? Nothing but a single-seater and not so much faster at that, said Davis. A hundred and ninety-five is the best even the latest single-seater combat planes will do at low altitude. Even for short bursts of speed? asked Evelyn. Diving, you'll run up faster than that, Davis explained. When we went straight down after Varus, we must have gone over two hundred. But for straightaway work, we've nothing that will catch Varus. What's the official speed record? asked Evelyn, toying with a test tube. She looked singularly pretty in the long white apron she wore in the laboratory. Two hundred and fifteen, I think, said Davis. Some Spanish aviator made it. 
He doped his gas with picric acid, though. What does that do? asked Teddy quickly. It's explosive and about doubles the force of your explosions. It eats your engines right up, though. They used to use it in motorboat races until a rule was made against it. You see, an engine is ruined after twenty minutes or so, and it made the racing unfair for people who couldn't buy a new engine for every race. Teddy's face grew thoughtful. Picric acid, he said meditatively. Suppose we used it in the gas of your plane. Would we have a chance of catching Varus? I don't know, Davis said thoughtfully. I hardly think so. It would make our speed better, but if it were anything of a chase, our motors would be ruined before we'd gone far. The acid attacks the steel of the cylinders and makes the bores too large? Teddy seemed to be thinking rapidly. Yes, you lose all your compression. Teddy looked at Evelyn. Suppose the pistons and the interiors of your cylinders were plated with platinum. Platinum is one of the hardest metals and should stand up under a great deal of wear. Would platinum resist the attack of the acid? Davis grew excited. Surely. Davis jumped to his feet. Then we've got him. New piston rings will let you plate the cylinders without reboring them, unless you're going to plate them heavily. Can you do the plating? Try, said Teddy. We make a hundred and eighty with straight gasoline, said Davis excitedly, with doped gas. How long will it take to fix my motors? Four or five hours. We'll borrow the acid vats of some electroplating concern. Evelyn will mix a solution of platinum salts. I'll go arrange to borrow the vats while you get your motors disassembled and brought here on a motor truck. Teddy hastily began to put on his coat. You're going to try to fight Varus again? asked Evelyn anxiously. Are we? asked Davis cheerfully. Just ask me. We are. You hit him several times in the last fight said Evelyn faintly, and it didn't do any good. We'll use armor-piercing bullets this time, said Davis exuberantly, or we may be able to mount a one-pounder automatic. I think the plane will stand it, and at worst we can ram him. Evelyn turned a trifle pale. That means you'll both be killed. Davis smiled. Maybe not. We'll take a chance anyway, won't we, Jared? Teddy nodded shortly. I'm going to get Varus, or he's going to get me, he says succinctly. They started for the front door. The commissioner of police was just getting out of his car. News, most likely, said Teddy, and they waited. The commissioner of police looked worried when he shook hands with Teddy. My men have been trying to trace that package that contained the bracelet, he told him and have found that it was put in a country rural delivery mailbox after dark. The mail carrier took it when he made his morning route. There's absolutely no way of tracing it any farther. Anyone might have passed by in an automobile and have put it in. The farmer in whose box it was is above suspicion. Now, another set of letters has been sent in the same way from another rural delivery box a hundred miles from the first. One is addressed to Miss Hawkins, I have it here. The postal authorities called me in when they saw the envelope. He showed a huge yellow envelope addressed to Evelyn. In one corner was a large return card. The Dictatorial Residence. It might be almost anything, said Davis. Better not let Miss Hawkins open it. I'll do it, Jared. Teddy shook his head. We'll tell her about it, and I'll open it in the laboratory. Evelyn and Davis waited apprehensively until Teddy emerged from that room. No coal bombs, no electric shocks, and no poison gas, he said, smiling. Just a billet doux to Evelyn. It fits in beautifully with our plans, Davis. Evelyn took the sheet he extended to her and read, The Dictatorial Residence, August 29th. His Excellency, Vladislav Varos, Dictator of the Earth, has been much annoyed by the efforts of one Theodore Gerard to obstruct his plans and desires. He has been informed through the press of the fact that Miss Evelyn Hawkins has collaborated with and encouraged Theodore Gerard in his rash attempts. His Excellency the Dictator is pleased to require that Miss Evelyn Hawkins repair to a spot some five miles due east from Norman's Reef 
off the coast of Maine. Miss Hawkins may bring with her a maid and such baggage as she may require. She is to be held as security for the cessation of Theodore Jarrett's efforts to impede the secure establishment of the dictatorship. The Mississippi River has been closed to traffic and will remain closed until this order has been obeyed by Miss Hawkins. The time set for Miss Hawkins's appearance at that spot is daybreak of Tuesday, September the 3rd. Given at the dictatorial residence, Vladislaw Varus. Evelyn looked at the three men with a white face. The commissioner of police looked grave. Davis was smiling, and Teddy was smiling too, but with a blaze of anger in his eyes. Jared, said Davis whimsically, I am much depressed that Varus didn't include me with you as making efforts to obstruct his plans and desires. The government will have to be notified, said the commissioner of police solemnly. Do, do you think I had better go? asked Evelyn hesitatingly. No, exploded Teddy and Davis together. Teddy went on. Why, Evelyn, the man is insane. And besides, we've just thought of something that's sure to get him. We'll lay in wait for him, and then he'll walk into our parlor nicely. When he does. Fini, said Davis cheerfully, if I may borrow a phrase from the French. And if it's a long chase, said Teddy even more cheerfully, the dear person set the time for dawn, and we'll have the light to fight by. Let's go and set to work on that plane of yours. They left together in high spirits. Evelyn stood quite still after they had gone, absently crushing the letter from Varus in her hand. Presently, with a sob, she went to her room and allowed herself to cry. They would not let her face danger, but Teddy was going out to fight, perhaps to die, and for her. Over at the hangar, mechanics swarmed upon the fighting plane, dismounting the motors and disassembling them. The cylinders and pistons were being carefully packed. A big motor truck had already backed up at the wide door of the aeroplane shed, and as fast as the parts were packed, they were loaded on it. Davis was there, here, and everywhere. He had asked permission for the experiment, and it had been granted. The government was prepared to risk almost anything rather than allow Varus to succeed in his huge blackmailing of the entire human race. There was no hesitation in allowing anything that might afford a fighting chance of drowning the black flyer. The Mississippi floods were growing in size and destructiveness. The New York coal bomb, dropped the night Teddy and Davis had fought the black machine over the harbor, was expected to explode at any moment. Every window, still intact in the city, had been pasted with strips of paper to keep the fragments from becoming a menace to those on the streets when the bomb should burst them. Davis had conferred with the commandant of the forts, and volunteers had been asked for among the garrison. A boat was being heavily armed with concealed guns, it would go to the point where Varus would expect Evelyn to be taken. He would see the small boat, drop down to take Evelyn on board his evil craft, and the massed batteries of anti-aircraft guns would open on him in a blast of fire. Teddy's discovery that flares fired into the cloud of liquefied gas would cause it to burn harmlessly in midair had been adapted to protect the crew. As the guns opened on the hovering black flyer, a stream of fireballs would be made to float overhead to set flaming the stream of liquid hydrogen Varus might be expected to shoot downward. At that, though, the mission of the boat crew was hazardous in the extreme. The telephone rang in the hangar. Teddy was on the wire. He had commandeered the big wooden acid vats of an electroplating plant, and the platinum plating solution was being mixed even then. If Davis brought the motors over in parts, the plating might begin immediately. The big truck rumbled off, Davis smiling confidently on the seat beside the chauffeur. Half a dozen mechanics perched on various parts of the load. When the truck stopped before the electroplating plant, they leaped off and rushed the glistening cylinders inside. In twenty minutes, they were in the plating solution, and an almost infinitely thin film of platinum was slowly forming within them. 
The workmen of the electroplating plant labored far into the night on their task. Teddy had insisted that a film of platinum ten times the thickness of the usual precious metal plating be used, and the process was slow. When the cylinders had been prepared, the pistons remained, and the exhaust ports and valves. These, too, were coated with the hard, acid-resisting metal, and Davis's mechanics began their task of fitting piston rings to the altered motor parts. The rings themselves had to be plated, and all the plating burnished and polished. Teddy and Davis snatched a few hours' sleep while the motor in its disassembled state was being carried back to the hangar and reinstalled in the aeroplane. They woke, and during all the following day, Davis sat in the pilot's seat, listening with a practiced ear and aiding in the final tuning-up of the changed motors, adjusting the carburetors to their new fuel. Thirty percent of picric acid added to the finest, highest-grade gasoline was to be used. No one had dared use such a percentage before, even for motors that were expected to be ruined. Teddy, in the meantime, had familiarized himself with the small one-pounder automatic gun, similar to the German anti-tank weapons, that was to be installed in the bow of the aeroplane. By nightfall all was finished. Teddy ran over to New York and saw Evelyn for the last time before making his attempt, and the next morning he and Davis flew to Norman's Reef, where a camouflaged hangar had been erected on telegraphed instructions from New York. Tuesday dawn found them alert and anxiously scanning the sky for a sign of the black flyer. End of chapter 9《10 of a thousand degrees below zero by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 The stars winked palely from the graying sky. In the east a pallid whiteness showed which slowly yellowed and then turned to pink. The dawn was breaking. On the little reef men watched keenly. Far out to sea, its single funnel tipped with red paint from the crimson sunlight, a little boat tossed and rolled. The boat contained the men who had offered their lives for a chance to kill this Varus who threatened the liberty of the world. Beside the camouflaged hangar, two great horns, seeming to be enlarged megaphones, pointed toward the sky. Little wires ran from their posts to telephone receivers strapped to the ears of intently listening men. They were microphones to detect the first sound of the musical humming of the Black Flyer. Teddy and Davis were befurred and goggled and had pushed up their goggles to take powerful glasses and scan the sky eagerly for a sight of their enemy. Mechanics stood ready at their propellers of the hidden fighting plane prepared to spin the motors into roaring life the instant the two aviators had settled in their seats. From before the wide doors of the concealed hangar, a broad expanse of beach ran smoothly down to the ocean. The little boat tossed and rolled. The men at the microphones listened intently. The others searched the sky. Straight down from a wisp of golden cloud, a slim black speck fell toward the earth. At first so high was it that even those with field glasses could make out only the thin shape of the glistening black body. It fell a thousand, two thousand feet. The whirring disks above the slender body became visible, then the enclosed cabin near the center. The musical humming filled the air. Lower and lower the strange machine dropped. Davis and Teddy were in their seats. Now, said Davis sharply, and the propellers whirled. The motors caught, sputtered, and began to run with a steady droning roar. Davis watched keenly as the black shape slowed in its fall and came to a standstill above the little tossing boat. Half a dozen men were holding the aeroplane back, and the small shed was full of clouds of choking dust and still more choking fumes from the motor. The black flyer hung motionless, barely three hundred yards above the small boat. There was a long moment of waiting. Then the decks of the boat seemed to fall in, 
a dozen threatening muzzles were exposed a dozen flashes of flame shot up from the tiny vessel simultaneously davis cried out and the men released his machine and it darted forward he took off from the beach skimmed the waves and shot out toward the strange combat that was taking place the black flyer had been hit that much was certain it lurched and staggered in the air losing altitude all the while then the pilot seemed to regain control he swung swiftly to one side and began to rise all the time the anti-aircraft guns were firing viciously the tossing boat made a poor platform for the gunners however and their aim was inevitably poor the guns kept up a ceaseless roaring Puff after puff of white smoke showed where their shells burst near Varus. He began to swerve, to zigzag, using tactics strangely like those of a dragonfly. Suddenly he darted to a point exactly above the small boat, and a smoky cloud began to dart down from below his machine. Varus passed on, but the cloud fell swiftly, precisely like the cloud of liquefied gas he had poured down on Teddy and Davis above New York Harbor. "'Flares!' cried Davis, in an agony of apprehension, though his voice was only audible to Teddy's by means of the telephone connection between the two helmets. As he spoke, the men on the boat shot up the little fireballs that had protected the aeroplane in its former flight. A dozen balls of light sped up to meet the menacing cloud of liquefied gas. They reached it, sped into it, glowing feebly. The white cloud did not ignite but fell on toward the boat it reached and enveloped the little vessel and suddenly the guns were still damn him said teddy in a voice that shook with rage he's not using hydrogen we can't close in on him now our flares are no good davis tilted the nose of his machine upward and teddy stared down his sights he pulled the trigger the gun kicked backward but the recoil cylinders did their work the tracer's shell left a little line of smoke behind it it passed below the black body too low said teddy grimly and fired again varus began to climb straight up his machine went but with the picric acid giving added impetus to the explosions in the cylinders the two-seater climbed as rapidly varus's ascent swerved he was directly over the aeroplane a whitish cloud appeared below his machine and blotted it out for an instant. We zoom, said Davis, almost gaily, and the fighting plane seemed to be dancing on its tail for an instant. The cloud of gas unfolded itself down to the surface of the water, barely twenty yards before the space in which Davis had checked his course. Around and around a huge circle. The biplane had caught up with the black flyer and davis turned toward it for an instant to give teddy an opportunity to fire there was a flash at the stern of the slender black body and the symmetry of the glistening form was marred by a ragged edge where the tip of the tail had been blown off almost said teddy grimly he'll dive now davis was prepared for the maneuver and almost as soon as the helicopter began to drop the biplane darted down after it Teddy firing viciously. The streaks of smoke that his shells left behind them told him where he missed. Varus shifted the course of his fall, and again a cloud drifted in the air just before the pursuing plane. Davis flung the joystick forward, and the fighter fell into an absolutely vertical dive. A second more, and it had turned upon its back and was flying upside down away from the threatening mist. Davis twisted in midair and righted his machine. Varus was darting away, barely two hundred feet above the surface of the water. Again the two-seater dived upon him. Teddy's shells were zipping dangerously near the black machine. It began to zigzag, to twist and turn like a snake. It doubled back and shot directly under the biplane, but too far below for the deadly mist to be used. Davis banked at a suicidal angle and went after it again. They passed directly above the silent small boat, drifting aimlessly on the waves. Little icicles were forming on the bulwarks, showing that the cold of the liquefied gas was still intense. For one instant, 
Teddy had a perfect sight and pulled the trigger with the peculiar confidence of a marksman who knows he is making a perfect shot. There was a flash from the upper portion of the black hull. A dark object shot off in a tangent from one of the whirring disks. The helicopter sank rapidly. Teddy gave a shout. Landed! The black machine recovered again. One of the disks was badly injured and now slowed and stopped, showing that the blade of one of the four sustaining propellers had been broken. But the remaining three increased their speed. Varus seemed to abandon the idea of fighting. He began to shoot away toward the northeast. He was more than a mile away, and Teddy had stopped firing. Varus had had no difficulty in distancing the same machine a week before, and anticipated no trouble in losing it even with his own flyer partially crippled. He had not reckoned on the Pickrick compound now being used for fuel. The biplane sped madly after the fleeing black aircraft. The motors roared hugely, and the wind was like a solid mass pushing fiercely against Teddy's exposed head. A small half-moon of glass protected Davis from the wind, but for the gunner no such protection was practicable. The rushing of the wind through the wires and along the sides of the streamlined body amounted to a shriek. Never has such speed been known before. Davis's voice came quietly to Teddy above the sounds outside, muted by the heavy padded helmet. The telephone receivers were fast against Teddy's ears. We're making two hundred and twenty-six. We're not gaining, said Teddy grimly. Wait until he rises. The motor's adjusted to be most efficient at about seven thousand feet. The black speck ahead of them was drawing no nearer, it is true, but it was not dwindling. The silver wings of the biplane cut through the air with fierce impatience. It flew in the straightest of straight lines after the other craft. Dark brownish smoke blew backward from the bellowing exhausts, tinged almost to saffron by the presence of the explosive acid. The sunlight kissed the upper surfaces of the wings of the pursuing plane. Before them the ocean rolled and tossed. Whistling winds and roaring engines. Speed, speed, speed! The biplane rushed with incredible swiftness through the air. The black flyer skimmed lightly on, barely in advance of his white-winged enemy. Twice Teddy essayed a shot, but the biplane trembled so that the accuracy was impossible, and he could see by the smoke of his tracer shell that he had gone far wide of the black machine. The space between the black speck and the waves below it seemed to increase. Rising, said Davis, now we'll get him. Teddy kept his eyes fixed on Varus's slender, needle-like craft. He was barely conscious of the upward tilt of the machine in which he was riding, but he saw that they were keeping pace with Varus as he rose in the air. Four thousand feet, said Davis crisply, and two hundred and twenty-nine miles an hour. There's land ahead. Teddy saw a mountainous coastline becoming visible far away. The black flyer continued to rise. Six thousand feet said Davis, and two hundred and thirty-two miles. The pilot of the other machine saw that they were gaining. He dropped abruptly. Now! exclaimed Davis fiercely. He dived downward. The descent, coupled with the immense power of the engines, now delivering vastly more than the eight hundred horsepower for which they were designed, made them shoot toward the black flyer with increasing speed. The other machine was barely more than half a mile away, and every detail of its construction was visible. Teddy noticed for the first time a slender tube rising between the two center-sustaining propellers. He instantly leaped to the conclusion that it was the means by which the jets of liquefied gas had been shot out. He fired. "'A hit!' cried Davis. There had been a flash from the top of the cabin. A jagged rent appeared in the polished roofing, and the slender tube vanished. The black flyer seemed to abandon all hopes of escape. It sped madly for a gap between two of the tall mountains that rose along the coastline. 
At the unprecedented speed with which both machines had been traveling, the coast seemed fairly to rush at them. No villages were visible, but it seemed to be a habitable, if not an inhabited, land. The black flyer swept on across country, Varus evidently making every effort to gain even a few yards on his adversaries, and Davis just as fiercely determined that he should not. Once, twice, three times Teddy fired. A smoothed and enclosed field, almost surrounded with small buildings, appeared. Varus dashed toward it desperately, the white-winged biplane vengefully after him. The black flyer dropped like a stone, and the biplane dived straight for it. In that last dive, Teddy worked his one-pounder as coolly as if at target practice. Flash! Flash! The black flyer crumpled and fell the last fifty feet as an inert mass. Teddy jumped from the biplane as it flattened out and settled to the ground. With his automatic pistol drawn and ready, he darted toward the partly wrecked black machine. As he drew near, a sallow face came weakly to a window of the cabin. An automatic flashed from beside the face, and Teddy heard a queer sound and a fall behind him. He did not stop, but rushed on, shooting viciously at the face of the opening. He reached the wreck, wrenched open the door, and swung into the cabin with utter disregard for danger. A tall, lean, sallow man was sitting exhausted in the pilot's seat of the black flyer. His right arm was crimsoned from a wound in his shoulder, and blood spurted in little frothy jets from a second wound in his neck. Teddy's fire had been better directed than he knew. As he entered with pistol ready, the sallow man raised his head erect by a tremendous effort. A hooked nose, a merciless mouth, and blazing eyes filled Teddy with repulsion. The sallow man stared at him superciliously. "'I am Vladislav Varus, dictator of all the earth,' he said in a metallic voice. "'I command! I command!' Speech failed him. His head dropped, and he fell limply from the cushioned seat. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of a Thousand Degrees Below Zero by Murray Linster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven Teddy felt the fallen man's breast, but he was not breathing. In any event, there was nothing that could have been done for him. An artery had been cut by a splinter of the one pounder shell that had smashed the roof, and he had bled quietly to death only trying desperately to land and get assistance before he died. The sight of Teddy and Davis sprinting toward him with drawn pistols had been too much for his hatred, however, and he had fired his automatic at them even as he was dying. Teddy found Davis lying on the ground with a bullet in his hip. "'I'm all right, Jared,' said Davis cheerfully when Teddy went to him. "'Just see if there are any more chaps in these houses before you bother with me.' Teddy explored the place thoroughly. There were many signs of human occupancy, but no one save Varus himself had been there when they landed. He returned to Davis to find him weakly trying to improvise a pad to stop the bleeding. Teddy lifted him and carried him to the house that seemed to be the most used. In a little while, Davis was quite comfortable and contented. He lit a cigarette and calmly began to read one of the newspapers that littered the place while Teddy continued his explorations. The landing field was a small one, no more than a hundred and fifty yards long by seventy-five wide. At one end was an unpretentious but comfortable dwelling, in one of whose rooms Davis was at that moment resting. At the other end a shed evidently formed the hangar for the black flyer. Along the sides of the enclosure were long sheds, some of them empty, some containing supplies of various sorts. Half a dozen coal bombs, complete except for the mysterious treatment of their surface that gave them their strange property, lay on the floor of one of the sheds along the sides. Another shed, long disused, had provided quarters for workmen. Teddy found the single exit that led from the enclosure. 
it opened on the wide hillside and afforded a view of miles without a sign of human habitation the remnants of a wheel track that had obviously not been traveled for months lay away from the door along that primitive road the materials for building the enclosure and the black flyer had evidently been brought teddy went back to davis jared said davis amiably i'm a fake i've lost quite some blood you know and i was pretty weak but while you were gone i saw a small black bottle on the shelf over there and i managed to crawl over to it wherever we are prohibition hasn't struck in and i took just enough to feel all right again i believe i can drive back it wasn't more than a two-hour drive anyway was it between two and three said teddy smiling we were making terrific speed though we're probably in newfoundland somewhere or iceland to tell the truth i'm quite indifferent suppose you help me out to the machine again i want to see what i can find in the laboratory first said teddy the laboratory was of the smallest whatever experiments had been necessary to perfect the coal bombs and the black flyer had been made elsewhere teddy found a number of notebooks which he took he found many chemicals some in considerable quantities in receptacles about the laboratory but no clue to the mysterious process that had enabled varus to threaten the world's security he left varus where he lay both he and davis confidently expecting to return and investigate thoroughly both the coal bombs and the black flyer davis especially was anxious to examine that strange machine in detail but his wound was painful and he wished to have it properly dressed besides this the whole world was waiting anxiously to learn its fate whether varus's ambitious plans were to be frustrated or whether it would have to put its neck beneath the heel of the mad dictator teddy lifted davis to the machine and after some difficulty they started off davis circled above the small clearing until it was tiny beneath them course is southwest he remarked to teddy we'll notice where we land and then a northeast course will bring us back here again or nearly right said teddy abstractedly his mind leaped ahead to the moment when he would see evelyn again he had seen her just before starting for norman's reef and she had seemed pale and anxious he was not sure but he hoped he was right in believing that she was more anxious than she would have been had she looked on him merely as a friend or comrade the biplane sped over the sea across which it had flown in such desperate haste that morning davis was weak but for straightaway flying modern machines need but little attention the new inherently stable aeroplanes are so safe that an amateur could pilot one in mid-flight and davis had taken a small quantity of stimulant to supplement his strength at that however his endurance was severely taxed before he flattened out and taxied across the landing field on staten island mechanics rushed out to greet him and help him from the machine varus is dead and the black flyer is smashed said davis cheerfully and incontinently fainted teddy made a hasty report to the commandant of the forts and rushed to new york the second coal bomb had exploded that morning and the city was panic-stricken but as his taxicab sped uptown the extras began to appear announcing the removal of the menace to the world the frightened crowds changed to happy cheering ones if teddy's identity had been suspected as he passed swiftly through the streets he would never have gotten through he would have been dragged from the motor car to be cheered and re-cheered as it was he made his way quickly to evelyn's home he sprang up the steps and burst open the door not waiting for the servant to open it as he rushed into the hall evelyn came into it through an open door she saw him and her face was suffused with joy you're safe she cried joyfully and burst into happy tears teddy took her quite naturally into his arms and held her there a moment she sobbed quietly on his shoulder for a second clinging to him then pushed him away and stared at him while a hot flush overspread her face oh she exclaimed in a rush of shame i i, I... she turned and ran away teddy caught her what's the matter he demanded her cheeks were still crimson i 
I kissed you, she said desperately. And you, uh, you hadn't said... Teddy laughed happily. I hadn't said I loved you. Well, if that's all that's bothering you, just listen. And Teddy said it several times. Davis was up and about in less than a week. His wound had been of little importance, and with a crutch which he took with pride in using with dexterity, he was able to move about almost as well as ever. He came over to tea with Evelyn one afternoon. Teddy was there, too, of course. Davis was boyishly showing off how well he could move about. Teddy watched him critically. "'That's all right, Davis,' he said in a paternal tone. "'But you want to get rid of that instrument as soon as you can.' Well, "'What for?' demanded Davis, deftly swinging himself into a chair. "'We're waiting for you to get well,' explained Teddy with a smile at Evelyn. "'It isn't considered good form to have a groomsman who is a cripple.' "'Groomsman? Who? What? You two? Davis stared from one to the other. Teddy nodded, and Evelyn turned slightly pink. Davis turned to Teddy. "'They tell me you and I are to be impressively decorated for smashing Vodas, he complained. "'And there'll be moving pictures taken of it and shown everywhere. "'I want to be a touching picture, all wounded up, you know, when that happens. "'A girl threw me over six months ago, and she likes the movies.' When she sees me beautifully mangled and being kissed by bearded people who pin medals on me, she'll be sorry. Mayn't I wear a crutch until then? Teddy laughed, and Evelyn smiled affectionately at Davis. If it's like that, of course, said Evelyn, we'll wait. But Teddy's in an awful hurry. I would be too in his place, said Davis promptly. He assumed an expression of extreme reluctance. "'Well, I suppose I'll have to get well.' Teddy shamelessly squeezed Evelyn's hand, and she shamelessly squeezed back. "'There are compensations for having to wait,' said Teddy generously, "'provided, of course, it isn't too long.' Davis looked at them, and his eyes twinkled. "'Well, then, in that case—' He started for the rear of the house. "'Where are you going?' Davis looked over his shoulder with a grin. "'You people compensate each other for waiting,' he smiled amiably. "'I'm going to go out in the laboratory and kiss the galvanometer.'" End of chapter 11 End of One Thousand Degrees Below Zero by Murray Leinster